In the last video, I picked up this wrecked Kia SUV with some moderate damage, and after I got it home, I assessed the damage so I could put together a game plan on how I'm going to get this car fixed. We have this panel that is supposed to be sitting right about here. All of this structure got pushed back by a good margin. By this point, it became pretty apparent that I'm gonna have to get this car up on the frame rack to pull all of the damage back out. But as of now, I couldn't even get this car off the trailer because we also had some suspension damage. The tire was wedged against the fender to where the wheel wouldn't even turn. After taking a closer look, I could tell that the lower control arm was toast and also the CV axle was busted. I was able to source a brand new axle from my local auto parts store, but I could not track down a new or used lower control arm anywhere around in my entire state. So as a temporary fix, I ended up heating up and beating this damaged control arm back into shape just so I can get the car off the trailer and into my driveway. Once on the ground, I wanted to see what sort of surprises awaited inside. And amongst the trash and filth that I found throughout this entire vehicle, the only things that are worth mentioning, simply for the fact that this is generally something I don't find in the cars that I buy, was this gold ring, some weed in a Ziploc bag, and also some human remains in the form of grandma's ashes. After that, I got the car mounted on my homemade frame rack, then, with the use of a laser, I got it perfectly leveled out side to side, after which I was quickly able to pull the upper rail back into its original position, as well as bringing down the driver's side frame rail just by a few millimeters. And everything checked out great, according to laser. Center of a hole. Center of the hole. We've got a lot to cover in today's episode. Class is back in session, so let's begin. I started out my day with a hunt for a replacement bumper cover. There is a place local to me that specializes in bumper covers only, and they got tens of thousands of them. This is the right cover for my application, but it's got a huge crack in it. Well, the deal is, if I'm buying a bumper from them, even if it's damaged, they will get it all fixed up and have it ready for a pickup the following day. In the meantime, let's address the suspension. We got a replacement uh, lower control arm, and this one is nice and straight. And also, I ended up getting this uh, replacement OEM used CV axle, because I ended up getting this used one for about a third of what I paid for a new one. So that new one is getting returned. First, let's get old and busted out of the way. Before I can slide the replacement control arm in this place, it's pretty obvious that we have a little issue here. This used to be enclosed. There used to be just a uh, round hole in here, and this was closed off. But as a result of an accident, lower control arm kind of got yanked outward, and it ended up tearing through. This is a replacement bolt because the original one was bent. So if I put the bolt in here and start threading it in, you guys can tell that that bolt doesn't really line up with the hole right here that's where it's supposed to be there's obviously more than one way to go about this but the solution that i came up with is i'm going to use this sacrificial bolt and this bolt is actually quite a bit shorter than the bolt that's supposed to be in there since i didn't have any thicker metal plate i ended up doubling up some of the thinner plate i had on hand i got both plates welded together and welded one more bolt to the other end of the plate next this contraption got screwed into the subframe so now let's go ahead and give it a pull just to uh, see how well this is gonna work out. I hooked up a chain to the second bolt that I welded onto the plate and attached the other end of the chain to the pulling tower. So here's what I'm trying to correct. When the control arm got ripped out of its nest, it pulled the mounting bolt out with it and that bolt in turn ended up rotating the nut that it's bolted into outward and I just rotated it back into its original position. So as of now, it's a perfect fit. Now we're ready to address this tear. First thing is, let's go ahead and check the thickness of this metal here. Looks like we got a two millimeter thick plate. And after taking a quick look through my box of bolts, I found this uh, bracket. I have no idea what this is from. And after taking a quick measurement, we got same exact thickness. So this little bracket will work. I'm going to trim this bracket to size, but I basically want it to end up right around here. First, I'm gonna drill out the bolt hole to match it up to the diameter of the bolt that will be passing through it. 
Obviously, I'm not going to be using the whole length of this bracket. I'm going to have to uh, trim it off back here. And also, I'm going to lose this tab here because uh, there's no need for that. We're going to need some bare metal everywhere where we're going to weld. Then cover the area with some weld through primer. The welding plate gets set in place according to the position of the bolt. This way, I make sure that the bolt will not bind up. After the first tack, I double check my work. It checks out and it's got a little bit of play, which is just what I want. That means that the bolt is not misaligned and it's not wedged in any way. Since I am dealing with slightly thicker metal than just the regular sheet metal, I turned up the amperage on my welder, but I did not turn up the wire speed. This way, I'll have a good heat penetration with the welds in the end looking more like they were done with a TIG welder instead of a MIG. That plate is definitely not going anywhere. A coat of self-etching primer will encapsulate all of the bare metal, followed up by some flat black paint just to blend the work area in with the rest of the undercarriage. At this point, I was done with all of the suspension work once everything got tidied up. Also, in the last episode, I drilled out and removed the side panel of the upper rail, mainly so that I could get an access to the area behind it. I did have some people in a comment section say that I should have replaced the upper rail because it's made of high strength steel. I did mention it in the last video that this was definitely not a high strength steel panel. Otherwise, I would surely be replacing it. Upper rail got pulled back out to its original position. And the last thing that I do have to straighten out is that side panel that I removed earlier. So I figured instead of just uh, banging this thing out straight, I will go ahead and stretch it out first. And I'm going to do it right with my pulling tower. Guys, I get it. I could have just replaced this panel because it's not even that expensive. But I think that the main purpose of my channel is to show folks what's possible. And maybe I just really wanted to see how well I can get this thing straightened out. All right, it got stretched out nicely and it fits in there just fine. It kind of looks like there is a bend right here, but it's actually just the way the paint is cracked. And uh, yeah, that's not a kink or anything like that. Everything is nice and straight at this point. So now I guess we're just ready to get this thing burnt in. Here's a tip. This one's not really a big tip. It's kind of obvious, but a lot of people still tend to overlook it. Whenever you do any kind of welding, make sure that you cover up real well. UV rays that the welding process emits are a lot more harmful than your regular sun rays. That means no shorts, no short sleeve shirts, always wear gloves and always wear a mask. Before this area gets enclosed, I first wanted to weld up a couple of small tears in there. Then I like to follow up with a steel brush to knock off any of the loose paint and ash to get the spot ready for primer. At the same time, I'm going to hit this panel with some primer as well. And lastly, I clean up the area by smoothing out all of the welds. It's the next day and our bumper is ready. So as you guys remember, there was a big old crack right through this area. They went ahead and uh, got this crack fixed on both front and back sides. So this way it's going to be a strong sound repair and the bumper cover will not split down the seam. And also on the other side, this uh, mounting area was uh, loose. And I guess the guy just went ahead and cut into the bumper in here and reinforced it from the outside in. And everything is feeling nice and tight. Another little bonus is I ended up getting this fog light cover as part of the deal. It just kind of came for free with the bumper. And as you recall, this whole area on our original bumper is missing. I'm going to have to do a little bit of polishing to polish out some of the uh, smaller scratches. But other than that, this bumper is ready. Back in the day, I used to use aftermarket bumper covers. A lot of them just did not fit well. And that is why I like mainly using OEM bumpers. Because as you know, OEM will always fit the best. Obviously, this bumper cover is nowhere near ready to be painted, so let's get it there real quick. Besides the repaired crack, there wasn't really any distortion to the plastic in this area, so this repair only required a thin coat of Bondo just to fill all of the minor imperfections. So whenever I work areas such as these, I don't like using flat, hard blocks, but instead I would use one of these foam blocks that are pretty flimsy. The good thing about it is, you see, if you look at this thing, when it's even in a relaxed position, it's got a slight curvature to it. Just by applying pressure to it in the right areas, you can shape this block to your curves. 
And whenever I do bondo work, I always have a fan running nearby. This way, all of the dust that I'm creating in this area gets blown out of my way, so I don't get none of it in my eyes, in my clothes, and I'm also not breathing any of that dust. First coat of filler took care of all of those minor imperfections. And for the second and final coat, I used some glaze to mainly fill all of those scratches that were left behind by the 80 grit sandpaper that I used to sand down that first coat. Guys, here's a pretty good tip for you whenever you're doing body filler. So let's say you got this area all filled in with body filler. If you're sanding all of these areas all at the same time, as time goes on, you will probably gonna take off a little more in the middle than you are taking off on the sides. And basically you're gonna end up digging a hole in the center. The way I do this is once the body filler is applied, I will at first go ahead and uh, work entirety of my work area and I will knock off all of the rough stuff. Like for example, I have some of the leftover stuff right here that I have not gotten to or gotten through. But other than that, for most part, everything else is sanded. So once I kind of get everything in a ballpark, what I do next is I start feathering out my edges all the way around my work area. And when all of my edges are feeling good where I cannot tell the difference between my existing panel and my body filler when that transition is like real real good that's when i will start working the center again and as i'm working the center i am blending out my center into my feathered out edges this is just something that i learned through a lot of trial and error try this out i bet you this will save you a ton of time and frustration okay so this area is done if you look I kept this body filler really, really thin. It is see-through in most of the areas. So normally as I sand, once I start seeing any of my high spots coming through, that's where I know that that area is done. I should not be sanding it anymore. Like right here, I busted through, so I stopped. And then I kept blending this area out this way. So this way, as I run my hand down, I don't feel any highs or lows. It's all nice, smooth transition, and it flows all the way to the edge of the bumper. And also, if I run my hand across this way, same thing. So if I were to close my eyes and run my hand back and forth in all these different directions, and I cannot tell where the transition area is while also making sure that none of my worked areas are lumpy, but are nice and straight and also flow perfectly with the body lines, when all of that is achieved, then that's how I know that I'm done sanding. It takes time to master this. Don't get discouraged if you don't get this down right away. It took me many years to get to where I am and I'm still learning. Whether it's bondo related, whether it's paint or framework or metalwork, I'm learning every single time on every new project. Next, with some 320 grit sandpaper on an orbital sander, I roughen up the surface adjacent to our work area so this way the primer has some rough surface to grab onto. And as usual, my primer of choice is this Luma Base High Build Primer that I apply with this $15 special Harbor Freight paint gun. If your bodywork is done well, then all that you really need is one wet coat of primer and you're set. And as usual, I finish things off with some cheap black primer that I use as a guide coat. Following day, with some 600 grit sandpaper, I smoothed out all of the primer and I ended up busting through the primer in a couple of spots, but not to worry, because we're gonna have a coat of sealer that's going to encapsulate the entire bumper, including the spots where we busted through. Final scent paste, coupled with a scotch bright, roughens up and cleans the surface of our replacement parts, and that's what I always use to get the panels ready to receive some paint. Hey look, we got a tent overhead and it's not even raining. Well, the reason we're gonna be working under this tent is because you don't want direct sunlight on these panels that we're gonna be painting because today is gonna to be a nice warm day and these panels will heat up really, really fast. And then if they are too warm and you're gonna start laying down some material on them, that material won't have enough time to flow out. And instead it's just gonna set up quickly and it will leave you with quite a bit of orange peel that you obviously don't want. Final cleaning with some wax and grease remover is super important and should never be skipped. It's your quick insurance policy just to make sure that everything is squeaky clean before any paint materials go down. To get our parts painted today, I'm going to use my new favorite paint gun. And it is an Iwata Kiwami 4. Sealer that I'll be spraying it with comes in three colors. 
white, gray, and black. And since the parts that we'll be painting today are white, then naturally the sealer that's gonna go under the paint will also be white. For sealer, I set my air pressure right around 30 psi, so about same pressure as I would use with the clear coat. And it also gets sprayed out just like clear coat, nice, glossy and wet. And remember, if your sealer goes down all lumpy with a bunch of orange peel, then every coat of material that will follow, whether it's base coat or clear coat, will reflect exactly what's going on underneath. So if your sealer goes down all orange peely, then your final result will also look all orange peely. And since bumper cover is mounted in the very front of the vehicle, that means that it will take the most abuse. Meaning that as time goes on, it will get bombarded by a bunch of small rocks, bugs and all types of road debris. And as a result, you are guaranteed to get a bunch of rock chips all over that bumper and to give the front end parts and especially the front bumper cover the best fighting chance against all of those rock chips is to seal it with two coats of sealer and this step will reduce the amount of all those rock chips by probably about 95%. After sealer flashed off, I followed up with two coats of base coat and then two coats of clear. And that resulted in a nice finish that was flat as glass. A good technique coupled with a good gun will give you results such as these just about every single time. And this is the proof that you don't need a controlled environment such as paint booth because I get results like these while painting in my driveway or my backyard. This really isn't rocket science. And just like Brian from Paint Society says, don't overthink it, it's just paint. And that means that every one of you who's watching this video right now with a bit of practice and a good paint gun can lay paint down just as good as this. Here I'm painting over the area that was repaired. The crack was right through this area and no one will ever be able to tell that that crack was even there. And now let's quickly jump back onto that upper rail because we still need to bond it just a little bit just to tidy things up. Before I apply any of the body filler, there's one last thing I got to do. This fender support. This thing gets welded in here somewhere right in this area, but I don't know exactly where it's supposed to go. So how can you tell? Well, the easiest part is to actually put the fender on, bolt this bracket up to the fender and the fender will basically dictate where this thing's supposed to end up on this panel. So the spot welder is just making a little dimple and the weld is just as strong as if I was using a regular welder. This next step isn't really all that necessary because this area will not be seen by anyone. It's going to be completely covered by the fender, but I figured I would tidy it up a little bit with some Bondo to smooth things out just a little more because why not? Then I quickly followed up with two coats of some white primer just to encapsulate everything that got worked. All right, so I'm done working with this area and now it's time to slam this car back together.
going on a first test drive and uh, the main reason for this drive is to see how off our alignment is. I have to hit a straightaway, straight stretch of road, straighten the car out. All right, and yep, we got a lean to the right side. I would say that in about 99% of the times, whenever you have suspension damage, you are going to end up needing an alignment afterwards because things will get thrown off due to the amount of damage to the suspension. And as usual, I don't like farming out stuff like, uh, you know, bodywork, paint, and also alignment. So I'm gonna go ahead and knock this out here in a minute and I'm gonna show you guys how I do it. Man, the interior of the car really smells like weed. This car is filthy and if you guys look, there's devil's lettuce all over. These cup holders are just uh, full of it. And it's also all over the floorboards as well. The smell of weed really makes me kind of a little nauseous, makes me sick to my stomach, so not a fan. So I'm gonna have to really get this vehicle cleaned out well. This car was so filthy, it was truly disgusting. It was so bad that I did not want to get in it to even take it on a test drive, but I went anyways and once I got home, first thing I did was I took my pants off and they went straight in the washing machine. Before any scrubbing takes place, first thing I gotta do is vacuum up all of the loose dirt. And to tackle the stains, I use the snifty brush that attaches to my drill. I'm not a fan of using harsh chemicals, even for cleaning, so I will always start out with some warm water with soap. And obviously if that fails, then I will resort to using something stronger. I get the fabric saturated with the soapy solution and it seems to be working since the soapy water is starting to turn a shade of light brown. And after scrubbing this filth for a few minutes, now it's time to get all of this loose dirt extracted out of the seat. This actually ended up working out even better than I expected. With a little bit of time and some persuasion, I actually got these seats looking like new and they also smelled a hell of a lot better. Here is a little comparison of before and after. And by the way, I will leave the links to cleaning tools and other tools that I used in this episode in the video description down below. And lastly, let's go ahead and address that alignment issue. These turn plates ensure that the wheels that I'll be aligning are free to move about without binding up against the ground. Steering wheel gets straightened out and locked into place. This way it won't move as I'm making alignment adjustment underneath of the vehicle. For the next step, I'm just using this fishing line and I'm gonna slip one end of it right over the exhaust pipe. Then I proceed to run the line all the way around the car while making sure that the fishing line doesn't get snagged up on anything and only makes contact with the tires and nothing else in between. And as I make my way back to the starting point, the line gets tied off in the exhaust pipe once again. You do want to make sure that there is quite a bit of tension on this line and that also that the line is passing roughly through the center of all four wheels. In theory, the wheel that's located on an undamaged side of the vehicle shouldn't have been affected by the accident. So right now we've got a straight line running between the front of the tire and the back wheel. So if we look on the back side of the front tire, if I put my finger right in here, you can see there's a tiny bit of movement. There's about a millimeter or so of a gap between the line and the tire. So this is how I know that we are within spec and I don't need to do any sort of adjustments on a side that hasn't been damaged. So now moving to the side that was actually damaged, we have a gap where I can almost stick my finger between the tire and the line. So now all I gotta do is drop under the vehicle, locate my outer tie rod, which is right here, and I gotta loosen up this nut. Now, if you run your finger on this part of the inner tie rod, you'll be able to tell that it is grooved and I am able to slip my crescent wrench right over it so I can rotate it. As I rotate it, the wheel will start turning and I'll continue doing it until I fully close up the gap between the line and the tire. 
Next, I tighten up the loose nut and I'm done. And that's all that it took to get this car lined back up. You know what? This was a really simple process. Took me about 10 minutes, give or take. Now I got the steering wheel nice and straight and we're going down the road, nice and straight. And the very last thing I gotta address on this car is this cracked windshield, along with this pretty fat rock chip. So the following day, I had this mobile windshield replacement guy come out to my house. It took him no time at all to pluck the old busted windshield out of the car. Then he ran a fat bit of caulking all around the perimeter. This guy was a total pro. He was so good at his job that he was able to BS with his friend on the phone the entire time that he was here and installed the windshield all at the same time. What a legend. And just like that, the new windshield was in and this project was officially finished. As usual, everything turned out beautifully. All of the gaps are looking good and uniform on our previously damaged side. All of the body panels are lining up just as they did from the factory. And as far as the paint work goes, I didn't have to do any cleanup whatsoever. No cutting or buffing. What you see here is exactly what came right out of the gun. No signs of repair can be seen from the engine bay, so I'm good with it. I'm really happy with the way everything turned out.